All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this month's Bloom Business Series webinar. Uh, my name is Jonathan Damaris. I'm the director of Downtown Inc. And we're uh, glad you're joining us here today to hear about authentic and inspiring storefronts. Um, today's event is made possible by our presenting sponsor, PNC. So once again, thank you, PNC, for your ongoing support of our 2022 Bloom Business Series workshop. And I'll also note that this is the concluding workshop for our, our season. So be looking for communications about our 2023 Bloom Business Series. Um, joining us today is Mark Evans. Mark is the Director of Planning at Dirk & Edson, a 35-person planning and design firm based in Lidditz, Lancaster County, uh, where he and many of his colleagues are focused on the enhancement of downtowns, um, enhancement and revitalization of downtowns um, across Pennsylvania. Um, as a town planner and architect, Mark has helped revitalize over 30 downtowns and commercial districts throughout Pennsylvania. Um, in this webinar, he'll draw on his experience with facade design, design standards, and downtown codes for West Reading, Honesdale, Sayre, and Shippensburg in Pennsylvania, as well as Mount Kisco and Ossining in New York, to highlight successful design strategies that can help small businesses enhance their storefronts. Uh, Mark has been a frequent speaker on topics ranging from downtown enhancement, placemaking, form-based codes, and civic space design. And I'll add that I had the privilege of hearing Mark at the uh, last year's Pennsylvania Downtown Centers Conference on a very similar topic, and the uh, presentation was phenomenal. Also had a chance to spend some time with Mark, um, giving him a tour of downtown York just a few months ago. Um, and uh, he's, a, he's a great guy, and he really is an expert in his field. So we're excited that he's joining us here today. So I'm gonna ask uh, Mark to go ahead and join us on camera here. Um, if you have any questions for Mark during the presentation, um, you can submit them through the Q&A or chat feature along the taskbar, and we'll save some time at the end for uh, those questions. So at any point, if you have questions for Mark, go ahead and submit those, and I will turn it over to Mark. So Mark, welcome, thanks for joining us today. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's great to be a part of this conversation and hope to bring a few fresh ideas to help uh, business leaders uh, in your community and beyond um, uh, move forward and enhance facades and really make downtowns even more vital uh, uh, through strategic investments. So uh, great to be here and great to be a part of this. Um, next slide. The, uh, you know, I think, Jonathan really covered that, but uh, you know, fortunate to have worked in a number of the neighboring communities, uh, Shippensburg and Mechanicsburg and Honesdale and uh, West Reading and a number of other communities, but uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, you know, some relevant experience. I keep next. Dirk and Edson uh, is fortunate to uh, sort of be involved in both campuses and downtowns and athletics in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, and uh, we're working in nearby uh, uh, York, York College and also uh, doing work uh, on some wayfinding uh, in the city as well for uh, for downtown York. Uh, we Part of what we do is we really kind of integrate the kind of the visioning process of, of helping, you know, redevelop a, an, an aging block or re- you know, re-envision an aging building and really bringing vitality into the downtown market uh, next. Uh, and part of the way we do that is through a process where we go through a, a kind of visioning and transformation process and where we, uh, next slide, where we really look at ways in which uh, redevelopment and visioning and uh, looking at streetscapes, sidewalks, um, you know, this is an aging shopping center in West Reading that uh, is actively being uh, um, transformed uh, uh, as we speak. And so, a lot of um, you know, kind of the planning of how we, you know, turn parking lots and turn aging aging sites into uh, uh, fresh and new contributions to downtown environments. Next, uh, here's another example where uh, in this downtown, the uh, some of, one of the side streets was really viewed as kind of uh, unnecessary during day to day traffic, and so next uh, we've created a vision for really the, the ability to close that street down on weekends and really use a kind of a, a uh, tilt up bollards and ways of transforming that kind of into more of an outdoor public place and really using public infrastructure in innovative ways. As you can see, you know, the storefronts and really the way in which the streetscape, the sidewalk and the 
uh, entire experience is um, you know, shifting and transforming and, and renewing. Next. Um, you know, we're often involved in sort of how we take it from kind of that downtown plan to then looking at redevelopment and facades and architecture and different community planning ideas and the visioning process and often design guidelines and certain kinds of zoning. But um, so the, the key focus that we're going to get into uh, right now is four topics, uh, really looking at the way in which it isn't just the storefronts that we need to be focusing on, but be aware how are we creating attractive, welcoming blocks, uh, streetscapes and sidewalks? And the storefronts are a part of that experience that draws people uh, and makes them say, hey, this is where I wanna be, this is where I wanna spend time. So we'll spend the majority of our time focusing on a number of facade enhancement design strategies and tools. Uh, and then we'll uh, get into a couple case studies and then uh, have a dialogue and discussion on uh, your questions. So the uh, you know, this is a sort of a typical example of kind of finding ways to really bring vitality of that relationship between the public realm where that storefront is a part of creating that vibrant and kind of well-lit, uh, well-landscaped experience. And so, uh, uh, next slide. So here's a handful of strategies that uh, I'll, I'll leave you with as uh, starting points because the storefront is, is part of this ecosystem of tying together how will outdoor dining, you know, a good merchandising plan for how to sort of show uh, whatever your business is offering, planters, signboards, um, perpendicular blade signs, because ultimately when the sidewalks are welcoming, when that experience is, is welcoming, there's more commerce, there's more foot traffic. I think you know, downtowns offer this unique and historic uh, uh, sort of draw to get people out of their cars, to get people out of their offices and get people kind of engaging together uh, in, in a Main Street environment. And so next slide. Um, and so part of how we do that is we want to make sure that we're focusing on the facade as a part of this you know, street tree environment, clear walkways, lighting, on-street parking, all these things are interrelated. Next. Uh, part of the you know, what we're currently working on in the city of Lancaster is a, a lighting plan. Where we're really looking at ways in which architectural lighting of the facades, architectural lighting of the civic spaces, and of the storefronts are a part of a cohesive whole. And so, next slide. Uh, and so, you can see here the way in which the the cornices, the architectural details uh, of each of the windows uh, and, and kind of the copper work that's part of what makes our downtowns unique and authentic. And so we need to make sure that we're doing all the right things, whether you're a business owner, a property owner, whether you're a downtown uh, uh, leader, uh, figuring out how do we get the public realm, the, the outdoor room that makes uh, our, our main streets vibrant, uh, all working together. So the storefront is a part of that, but how we, feature the buildings and how we make it feel safe uh, is all interrelated. Next. And one of the things that makes many of our downtowns vibrant and, and, and powerful is that they are active. And unfortunately, many of the second and third floors of our downtown buildings are underutilized. Uh, underutilized because there's, you know, Zoning says there's not enough parking or because someone's been using it for storage for the last 30 years or uh, building codes or challenges or life safety issues or sprinkler systems or there's a lot of challenges of developing those upper floors, but we need to work together and whether you're a property owner or a, a downtown leader or a municipal leader in figuring out how do we create the incentives for owners to modernize an update, you know, apartments, condominiums, office uses, and to sort of complement whatever may be the ground floor use, whether it's retail or dining. In many cases, figuring out how to get that commercial kitchen active, how to figure out how to fund that may take some creative incentives because if left to the market, you know, the doing those renovations to make kitchens happen may not happen unless there's good incentives and maybe even some grants or revolving loan funds 
to make that happen. So um, let's you know all recognize the challenges of activating these mixed use places. Next. Um, the other thing is that one of the pitfalls that many design guidelines or you know sort of storefront uh, standards gets into is a bit too much on the design standards where uh, the mandate to say you should have this style or that style uh, can can often get uh, very costly and can sometimes result in kind of false architecture. Um, you know, when we have you know Victorian buildings or Art Deco buildings. Uh, we need to find ways to sort of honor the current materials we have and not get overly uh, focused on kind of faux architecture. So, so I would say, uh, Dirk and Edson, we work hard to focus on good design, but you know, let's start with the form of making sure you have the entrances in the right location, the storefronts facing the street, uh, on-street parking, good lighting, good display windows. Once you get those four or five fundamentals going, um, and you have you know, quality materials, uh, you should be able to get most of what is successful in a downtown Main Street environment. Next. The other component that often gets involved in storefronts and how we kind of make our downtowns vital and vibrant is making sure that the zoning and the uh, uh, standards uh, are flexible enough to allow for innovation, allow for entrepreneurs to bring in a 300 square foot uh, a coffee roaster, a, a, a boutique you know, wine bar that may only be 300 square feet because innovation isn't these days is not happening at 3000 square foot a pop. It's happening 300 square feet, 500 square feet. So find ways to encourage and allow uh, that kind of uh, temporary and um, uh, kind of entrepreneurial uses so that maybe in the first three months, if they can, if a small business owner can demonstrate this new idea, maybe the municipality can say, hey, maybe the parking requirements might be triggered after some uh, trial period uh, if that happens to be a small use. So just one idea that we're seeing is getting a lot of traction. Next. Um, the other thing is that um, Many downtowns have storefronts and commercial frontages stretched out over multiple blocks. Um, this is uh, downtown Shippensburg, and we've been working with them to identify which blocks of King Street and of Earl Street are, are most appropriate where storefronts should be required, and which blocks are, are should storefronts be encouraged. And in certain cases, in the yellow ones, you know, which ones or storefronts not appropriate because they're more residential. So I think that's a discussion I think we need to have because it, it isn't just about zoning, it's about making sure that we create the incentives so that if, you know, if we have multiple adjacent businesses that are um, all with storefronts, you're gonna have a vibrant district. If you have a lot of um, non-commercial or non-retail non uses in a block, it's gonna make that block suffer. So next. Um, making sure that window displays are renewed regularly, uh, encourage businesses to uh, keep the lights on, um, you know, at least 12, 16 hours a day, because ultimately that is how the business is, is being perceived at nighttime. That is how the downtown is being perceived, is making sure that, that the lights are on and people can see it's fresh, it's new, it's being renewed. Give everybody a good reason to come indoors and knock on the door or open the door and come into the business. Next. The other thing is that, that far too often we end up getting um, parking at the rear, parking behind the building, and, and we end up having way too many entrances at the rear or side of a building. Let's make sure that the primary entrance is always on the sidewalk. So, um, See the uh, the other thing that can often occur is that um, uh, property owners can block up windows and block up doorways and and kind of create these dead zones. So we we strongly encourage the ordinances to ban uh, uh, blank walls uh, and make sure that on street parking off street parking is not visible from the street. Uh, and so uh, next slide. 
Uh, so you know, here's an example where uh, there's a, a, a former gas station that's undergoing some changes. Uh, next slide. And here you can see we really need to find a way to make it welcoming so that the storefronts on either side of this, this, this vacant, you know, sort of gas station lot are not a turnoff to, to retailing. So find a way to get uh, landscaping, fencing, piers, uh, we, we call it, sort of call it hedging and edging to make sure that parking lot is not the, the predominant thing that you see. Next. And then over time, we hope that, that, that we can create the necessary incentives, create the right economic environment where investment will occur, where uh, vacant sites become infill sites, and we bring new businesses, new uses uh, into, into downtown sites. Next. So um, I'm now going to shift uh, to sort of focusing on some design strategies specific to storefronts and facades. Um, we often collaborate with a group called Mach 5 Design. They are um, um, you know, uh, graphic designers that uh, complement our architects and our landscape architects and our, our planners. And so we, we find it to be a good collaboration. I'm happy to make an introduction to Mach 5 uh, at some point in time. So um, part of what we're recommending as, as a design principle is start first by keeping it simple. Um, signs and graphics uh, bigger isn't always better. Sometimes you're trying to draw people in and you want to show the furniture, the, you know, the, 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 the objects that are part of your business. And so do your best to you know, clear your storefronts of clutter so that your customer can focus on what's important. Uh, make your signs legible, keep flyers to a minimum. Uh, next slide. Keep posters out of the windows and things like that. Next point I want to make is color. Um, most storefronts do very well with just two colors. So do your best to keep it simple. And so make sure that if your company and your brand has one or two key colors that are part of your brand, or if the building has this amazing uh, red brick and you want to complement it with some color that, uh, that complements that, you know, sometimes it's a reflecting your brand, sometimes it's complementing the building, uh, you know, sometimes it's both, but uh, next slide. The other thing is uh, there's nothing better than uh, on a good storefront than bringing on the green. Uh, when our downtowns, when our storefronts look like they're cared for, when they look like somebody really is taking the time to water them, taking the time to make the window box look fantastic, it sends the message, people care, something is worth going through the door to see that business. So figure out how to bring green into your storefront experience. Next, window graphics. Um, logos and graphics that represent your business and communicate what you're doing, uh, what's important. You know, sometimes it's hypergraphics, sometimes it's keywords to let people know what kind of business are you? Why should I come in? Why is this relevant? So um, take the time to use vinyl and uh, sandblasting and other things to make sure that you communicate effectively um, your color, your palette, keep it fresh. Next. Uh, murals. There's lots of great examples in our downtowns of wall murals and paint colors and uh, uh, whether it's bringing art or sort of your, um, um, your brand uh, into the building. I, I think, you know, we, it's sometimes not a great idea to paint brick that isn't designed to be painted uh, and it can create some maintenance challenges if we uh, paint the wrong kind of brick. So pay attention to what kind of brick it is. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes there's ways to uh, kind of get that brand and get that kind of mural uh, effect uh, by, you know, bringing in, you know, vinyl and other, other materials to accentuate your design or your brand. Next. Um, within this area, I'm going to sort of uh, pepper in a few examples of just sort of typical costs so that uh, everyone can kind of recognize that we need to balance these things and say some ideas are um, 
going to be expensive and some are going to be more cost effective. And, you know, each business has to make a decision about where and how to invest. But, you know, a typical sill replacement can be a couple hundred dollars. A pointing uh, of brick can be, you know, five to twenty dollars a square foot. Next. Uh, painting uh, can you know, vary. A lot of it comes back to how much surface prep are you putting in and making sure that, uh, you know, in some cases, if it's a Victorian building, you may have a, a three color palette, maybe a four color palette, but uh, figure out how to keep the costs in range and um, you know, sort of understand the better prep you can do, the longer it will last you. Next. Um, here's a number of examples of signs. Uh, we're a big fan of projecting signs in, in a sidewalk-oriented Main Street district like much of uh, 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 York's downtown streets. Um, perpendicular signs should be encouraged. Uh, they are what the pedestrian sees. Many of the wall signs are more often what you see from a car. And so uh, most of the retailing that's occurring in our Main Street districts uh, are happening at the sidewalk level, and we need to make sure those perpendicular signs are great. The ones at the bottom there show examples of some really great wrought iron and some good gooseneck lighting so that you can see those at nighttime. Uh, lo love the scissors as well as an example of a kind of graphics that kind of communicate what you're about. You know, that, that communicates, this is a salon, you're going to get your hair cut here. What a great way to kind of send the message without saying hair salon. Next. Um, here's some examples of uh, some Lancaster County um, uh, examples of, of making awnings and you know, typical pricing. That's sort of $2,500 to $4,500 for some of the awnings you see up there. Um, but you can have custom printing on those awnings and other ways to make them either more contemporary as a flat panel or more of a shed style and more traditional. But uh, you know, all those things are possible. Next. Um, obviously, uh, Dirk and Ed's an example, but the uh, you know these can be um, you know sort of painted wood, or they can be different types of composite materials. Um, you know, sometimes as they get bigger and bigger, there are engineering costs. If this is a suddenly becomes a seventy-five pound sign, not a twenty-pound sign, you can require different kinds of engineering. So don't you know don't forget to overlook that. You know, in the thousand dollar range. Next. Um, another example of a blade sign, um, you know, coordinated with the various light fixtures you see there. Next. Uh, here is a um, uh, example of window decals that uh, in vinyl where uh, we can get, um, you know, ideas can, can be communicated very cost effectively if, uh, you know, hire a good designer and make sure that, that you've chosen how to get your message across, get your key ideas, what is it you do. Um, so effective use of, of vinyl and color can, can go a long way. Next. Uh, murals. Um, love a good mural. And uh, so many of our sides of buildings that have those kind of blank walls may be perfect examples where that kind of ghost painting uh, can be appropriate to uh, uh, introduce a mural uh, and kind of Kind of send a message. Obviously, this has to be compliant with zoning, so you've got to be careful how big it gets uh, to make sure that it's uh, going to be permitted by local regulations. Lighting. Um, I think there's few things more important, uh, you know, other than signage and lighting. Uh, various forms of externally lit goosenecks, and whether they be traditional or contemporary, whether they be um, you know, handcrafted metalwork. Um, ultimately, this is part of what's going to feature and highlight whatever is important about the architecture of your building and what's important about your storefront and signage. So uh, uh, always good to invest here. Uh, next slide. You know, these tend not to be particularly you know, as expensive. Obviously, there's operating costs, but uh, you know, two to four hundred dollars for some of these typical lights, uh, but then you need to make sure you know, how far you know, you know is there electrical service uh, at the building, and sometimes that can be 
uh, more expensive if you need to run new electrical runs and things like that to uh, to service them. So um, you know, also pay attention to sort of the um, whether you, the light fixture is a narrow focus on an individual sign or whether it's more of a wall washer. Um, there's a lot of different types of, uh, of examples. Uh, we work with some specialty lighting engineers from time to time if we have a more complex uh, lighting situation where you're trying to you know, wash a wall or wash cornices or, or over longer distances, but in that sort of $300 range. Next. Um, the uh, doorways, clearly from time to time, there's gonna be a need to replace a door here and there. Uh, that can be, I mean, there, there are some less expensive alternatives, but they can get expensive depending on uh, uh, what what manufacturer you go with, and you know typically that can be in that sort of two thousand dollar range. Next, um, one of the things that's happening in a lot of different uh, food and beverage uh, situations is the ability to kind of open that window wall, open the the you know sort of have the um, sort of outdoor dining feel in inside your your business, and so. Those sliding four panel doors uh, can get up there in cost, uh, but I think uh, they can also really create a dynamic environment for a, a, a business to sort of connect indoor outdoor dining and give you kind of that uh, uh, outdoor feel uh, within your space. And that can often be a payoff, uh, especially in the food and beverage world. So, um, uh, you know, Geldwin is you know an example of a company that may be worth looking at. Next, so um, I'm going to talk now about style. And uh, what we typically do with our clients is that we will um, take a look at the five different um, um, these five different styles and get get examples uh, in front of uh, our, our you know businesses and say, hey, which direction do you want to go in? And then next slide. And then we ask them, we'll typically put numbers on these and have businesses sort of pick which images appeal to them most. Uh, it, this is modern and minimalist, you know, tends to be more blacks and grays and whites. Uh, it tends to be uh, not a lot of bold, you know, not, not a lot of uh, primary colors uh, and uh, I think this can be effective if you're looking for that more kind of contemporary business and that's kind of your your, your vibe. Uh, next. Um, for a more, I'll say more feminine look with a more um, soft and fresh colors that may be a more boutique kind of uh, business, um, there are, uh, you know, we can move it in different colors there and and you know, have a, a softer palette that's a little bit more timeless and kind of nostalgic. Next. Um, you know, these are you know, obviously more intense colors for a more traditional and vintage look, if that's uh, part of your brand. Uh, and um, you know, if you have historic architecture or great trim details that, that uh, already exist in your building, this can be a great way to go. Um, in recent years, uh, this whole kind of uh, rustic kind of uh, barnwood uh, recycled lumber has been quite popular and finding ways to kind of bring that kind of rough hewn timbering, rough hewn uh, uh, materials uh, into the facade can be quite welcoming. And it kind of brings that kind of natural earth tone look uh, to your business. And that can be a, a great look as well. So um, I'm going to share a handful of case studies, um, um, you know, finding ways to kind of bring together your, uh, your kind of these design ideas that I shared earlier and kind of the best practices of how to activate your Main Street environment uh, is, uh, can be quite helpful. Next. Here's an example of a uh, of a soap company where the uh, let's see if my cursor is working here. So the uh, I think finding you know sort of 
when there are multiple planters like in this one here that are uh, um, sort of kind of not clear, I think we we suggested one simple planter might do a better job. Um, finding a way to uh, bring in a simple panel of awning and kind of a, a one splash of color tied in with the treads at the stairs. Uh, notice how we uh, shifted the color palette of the window frames from white to a taupe color to sort of let the storefront shine rather than having the white windows. You can see that it was kind of a, a mix of that kind of colonial um, pediment on top of the doorway. We suggested scaling that back and uh, find ways to sort of remove all of those eight and a half by 11 and 11 by 17 um, um, things in the windows so that the storefront really features the products that this business is all about. Uh, notice how we've added um, gooseneck lighting above the uh, Muddy Creek sign there. And you know, I think just a simple, clean, clear look. It's an example of a uh, of a office um, office equipment business that uh, you can see uh, that they were big fans of uh, Star Wars and uh, R two D two uh, lettering along the uh, sidewall of the building. I think we helped this uh, this client look at um, uh, pin lettering. So next slide. You can see that the, 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 the existing windows were undersized for the openings, the existing doorway was undersized for the opening. And so, you know, the recommendation is, you know, replace the windows, uh, pin mounted uh, um, metal letters, um, bring in a, a simple cornice, bring in an awning, lighting, um, uh, really accentuate the storefronts with um, um, new doors, new lighting, and uh, and then, you know, on the sidewall, um, you know, focus on a couple new windows and uh, really a more of a um, sort of ghost painting kind of um, on, on the sidewall would work just great. Next. Here's an example where the side block, the wall along the side street was uh, particularly um, uninspiring. And so here we felt that the colors needed help. The um, it's a little unclear whether you know, sort of the mommy and me and the furniture warehouse. So we thought maybe there's ways to put uh, signs in, in a different configuration that would work better. Next. So here we thought finding a way to accentuate the signage of those two businesses, each with their own sign, each on top of the, uh, the uh, uh, left and right storefront area. Uh, on the right, you can see gooseneck lighting, murals, and different ways of bringing in a way to break up this facade. It just needs a lot of help. Uh, and you notice that there's a stone base that kind of ties it all together um, uh, from both the front facade as well as the side facade. Next. It's an example of a kind of a, I don't know, maybe a late 80s, early 90s uh, kind of uh, office building that we were asked to take a look at. Uh, you'll notice that there's a rent sign, so there's obviously some space available. Maybe there's just not as much demand for office and there's time to uh, you know, let the upper floor be office and maybe the ground floor should in fact be uh, some additional flex retail slash office uses. Uh, next slide. So we uh, recommended a number of uh, projecting canopies, uh, added some color to the spandrel panel above the windows, uh, extended the windows all the way to the sidewalk and then and the doors to the sidewalk. So you in fact get four different storefronts and then the center is really an entrance to sort of bring you into the building and get you up to the upper floor. Uh, and this is really also trying to feature that sidewall with the cafe entrance as well. You know, in each of these, you know, we made certain recommendations as to what kind of materials and what kind of signage and what kind of lighting. Next. Uh, and the, uh, you know, here's an example of, a, of an aging building that's uh, got a lot of challenges. Uh, the cornice and the brick are in disrepair. The upper floor is unoccupied and uh, 
um, has a lot of plywood in front of the windows. Um, the windows are either blocked up or failing. Uh, many of the windows are, are sort of you know, strip windows on the ground floor, some inappropriate materials. Uh, and so one of the things we first recommend is really let's find photographs of the original uh, the original building uh, to better understand what kind of, of doors and windows were original, original to the building. Uh, next. And these are a series of recommendations for painting the cornice, repointing the brick, uh, um, window rehabilitation, um, uh, window treatments, lighting, adding gooseneck lighting, uh, enlarging storefront windows, and things like that. Next. And here's the rendering of what, uh, what we recommended, and I believe the property owner is actively working to, to build this out uh, as we speak. And so this uh, offers uh, you know, a whole storefront uh, look uh, facing to the left and then kind of a separate entrance uh, and uh, windows on the right with the red area there. So, so this is um, hopefully a, a, a nice step forward and you can see uh, refreshing the upper floors. Next, here's an example where this business uh, eventually expanded. This is a salon, and uh, they expanded from uh, the building on the left here and then expanded into the building at the right and connected it together. But you know, there's an air conditioner you know, out to the street. There's um, obviously a whole variety of colors, and you're not quite sure what services they offer. And, and so, you know, adding words uh, above the storefront to sort of describe what, uh, what kinds of services are being offered. It's a day spa and a salon. Uh, and we tried to focus on making sure that the primary entrance uh, is clear on the left. And we de-emphasize the secondary entrance on the right. And uh, notice how we kind of brought planters and really tried to uh, streamline the way in which the color palette of the um, the white and the black, this client really wanted to have a more uh, contemporary look uh, to the building. And we removed the kind of the pink and the blue colors from the uh, cornice work of the second floor so that it is a, a more of a neutral, neutral detail and kind of accentuates the uh, uh, Victorian nature of the, uh, of the cornice work. Next, here's another example where we had this sort of variety of um, two different businesses and apartments above uh, where the uh, coffee shop and donut business uh, wanted to have that black and green palette, but the green was a little bit offensive. And so we found ways to kind of bring green into the doors, let black be the dominant trim for the storefront. But then when it came to kind of the rest of the architecture, we looked at white um, uh, trim work to tie together uh, the cornice line at both, both buildings. And we used the same white to kind of tie together the, uh, uh, the first floor uh, roofing material as well. So uh, in many cases, it's, it can be simple moves of, of just choosing where and how to put splashes of color. Uh, and where and when to put benches and notice how you know we sort of tried to keep the planting pretty sim simple and um, uh, this client seems excited to move forward with this uh, uh, later this year. Next. The, um, the focus uh, in many cases of how do we kind of shape and guide this, I know that um, uh, at present, there's not a facade grant program in downtown York, uh, but uh, I know there's plans in the work to uh, get a specific facade program mo moving forward and kind of expand on your current uh, Bloom grant program and be able to offer more to local businesses. And so part of that is often communicating uh, what is the desired uh, an appropriate storefront design and inappropriate, making it clear through pictures and images, what's desirable, what's undesirable, uh, and the same would go for signage. Next slide. Same would go for uh, lighting and defining what kinds of lighting is desirable and acceptable, uh, as well as roofs and cornices and what kinds of materials would be uh, desirable and acceptable. 
Um, this is um, this is a, a, a college town in Connecticut, uh, University of Connecticut, where those design guidelines uh, took took form and and helped to shape and guide the storefronts for this uh, mixed use district uh, across from the campus. So I think um, you know an example of how to kind of bring those kind of focus on storefront design uh, into these new buildings, uh, obviously can apply just as much to existing buildings as well. So um, I think I'm gonna shift it uh, back to you, Jonathan, and you know, uh, give an opportunity to uh, have discussion and, and you know, address as many of the questions as time permits. Great, well, thank you, Mark. There was a, there was a plethora of phenomenal information in there. So I really appreciate you joining us here today. And I would add too, um, you know, for our audience tuning in today, if if you're somebody who's uh, involved in city planning, city design, uh, if you're responsible for city codes, or if you are a landlord, property owner, or if you're a merchant, I think there was applicable uh, material there in some context. I would also add too, um, uh, to all, all the folks on the call today, um, this, the recording of this uh, webinar will be available later on. So if you're a merchant and you want to share some of these ideas with uh, your property owner, you can certainly share this uh, webinar um, with them as well. Um, and Mark, you mentioned um, uh, a few possible you know, funding sources. You know, obviously, if you want to make improvements, you got to have the cash to pay for it. Um, and you, know, you mentioned our, our Bloom grant program and um, every year we do our downtown York Bloom Grant program, and we've seen some businesses and some merchants uh, use Bloom Grant funding for facade improvements. Um, but uh, Mark and Mark mentioned it as well. Um, as an organization, we're working on um, some funding through DZED to, for a facade improvement grant. So you'll hear more from Downtown Inc. Uh, next year about that. Um, so there's some potential uh, funding sources out there that we can uh, definitely tackle some of these these products that many of our merchants are are excited about on doing on their properties. So. I'm looking at uh, the chat here, and um, it's a few questions and thoughts coming in. I'll, I'll share those, and if anybody else has additional questions, feel free to to, um, to add those to the, the Q and A or the chat. Um, but we'll just jump in. Um, uh, let's see here. So, uh, Mark, what are some easy ways for business with very limited funds to make simple yet effective and affordable improvements to their storefronts? Um, and if they had to prioritize one thing, what would you prioritize? Signage, window displays, paint? If they had to kind of choose one thing to, to start with limited funds. I think um, cleaning up the storefront window and removing the clutter and maybe focusing on some, some vinyl graphics or things that would at least communicate the brand clearly. Because sometimes it takes a while to figure out what's happening. What, what are you offering? What's, why should I come in? And obviously you need to have great products displayed in your window. So I would say soon after doing that kind of clean and, and, and graphics, I would say do your best to provide lighting uh, and you know, make sure that, that there's lighting available you know, till you know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night at least so that for those who may, you know, your business may be closed at that hour, but Give everybody an opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to come back here because you're offering something that that I'd love to see. I think long before you start, you know, replacing doors and replacing, uh, you know, you know, doing, you know, lots of more expensive things, focus on transparency of your storefront, uh, good, good uh, merchandising in your front window. I, I would say start there. All right, thanks, Mark. So we actually had a few questions related to um, historic districts. In, you know, in New York, we have ARB. Um, the majority of our, of our business improvement district is within, um, the majority of the properties are uh, historic properties. So certainly there, there comes some challenges there, I think. Um, and I'm sure you've navigated those in your, in your experiences, Mark. Do you have any uh, tips for kind of navigating um, the powers that be that determine what is acceptable and what's not? Well, I think, uh... For starters, I think it's great. I know there can be a resource organizations like yours of being able to share. These are mm -hmm. things that have been successful in the past by your neighbors. So I think sharing case studies of what was approved in recent years and sharing you know, positive examples, hopefully, I think the opportunity is to say, here is what's approvable. Here's what's desirable. That's why I think in many cases, the 
design guidelines and, and sort of the being as transparent as possible uh, about what's the desired outcome. If the desired outcome is to you know, preserve historic windows and preserve uh, historic doors and, and not uh, get involved in, in heavy demolition of historic uh, uh, elements, uh, make sure that that's clear and transparent and hopefully uh, it is um, sort of the, uh, the intentions of those organizations are transparent and maybe that information can be put out there. Maybe there's a, a, a frequently asked questions section where you can say, hey, these are the eight or 10 things that, that are most appropriate. Uh, you know, may, maybe, maybe HARB or other organizations could get on a call like this and be able to share, here's what we'd love to see you know, and find a way to be proactive and positive rather than uh, creating an obstacle. So, so I think the more we know, the more we can make informed decisions about where and how to invest. Great, and I, and I would add too, I mean, I know we have uh, folks tuning in from around the state today, but any folks who are in downtown York, I mean, we, we've certainly advocated with merchants on various things uh, here before Harb, and we actually have a few products right now that we're working through as well. So uh, from an advocacy stand, standpoint, feel free to reach out to our organization um, to help facilitate that and, and make those connections happen. So um, we, uh, I mentioned people are tuning in from around the state. Uh, somebody from Haverford Township is uh, tuning in saying that they, they actually used ARPA funds to run a matching facade grant program, which is, which is phenomenal. Um, so uh, certainly, you know, using the funds that are available to that community. And, I, you know, in Europe, we also have ARPA funds as well. So something perhaps to advocate for. Um, question here about, uh, uh, how, how do we find out window building code requirements for storefronts? Uh, this individual owns a multi-store front property and are considering window upgrades, but uh, they're uncertain about the size material requirements um, and also a suggested resource to purchase storefront windows. So where's the go-to place for wi uh, window building code requirements or where should they uh, connect with? Yeah, I think... Um... Starting a conversation with the, the code official to say, hey, this is what, uh, you know, help me understand what I need to do. I, I think, uh, you know, frame the question to the code official and say, make sure that I understand what am I going to be required to do. I think most property owners and business owners are not familiar with the uh, International Building Code. or And so I think finding ways to at least ask your code official, what's it going to take to to to, to be you know, get an approval here. I think asking the question and at least uh, hopefully that can be provided as a as an FAQ on a website so that once they've answered the question for you, maybe that can be provided to the next eight or 10 people who want to know, you know, what are some best practices. In terms of um, uh, sources, I know that I, I did provide, um, you know, on this link, a number of different businesses that that do provide those typical um, uh, typical examples. I, I do have a couple of slides that I can certainly share with anybody who reaches out that has a, a list of resources that are certainly uh, easily available in the York County, Lancaster County area that may be available for local folks. Uh, so happy to share that as well. And, and some of those are, are were in the slides that I shared. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, somebody was asking about, um... Um, turning a, uh, a a street that's used by vehicles into a pedestrian only experience, um, and uh, the question is, how, you know, how do you convince uh, the powers that be, whether it's city administration or otherwise, to make that conversion? Um, and maybe I don't I don't know if you have any experience or knowledge about Westchester's permanent closure. I, I believe it's Gay Street in Westchester. Um, I'm sure there was an advocacy approach and I'm sure it was a multi-year uh, process, but I don't have any advice about communities that are looking to uh, create pedestrian only uh, spaces that were previously drivable. Sure, uh, I, um, I've i had a couple different conversations with uh, Randy Waltermeyer uh, from Traffic Planning and Design who helped accomplish that in Westchester. And I believe what they've done there is they have presented to PennDOT to say, hey, the borough wants to own this street. We no longer want it to be a PennDOT street. And they arranged for a way to make a, a, a state road into a borough road. And they, um, uh, I believe there was a, uh, I think Randy can talk more about exactly how they went about that. 
I know in West Reading, we are have been working with uh, the West Reading Community Revitalization Foundation and the borough. Uh, there's been a desire to look at 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 Sixth uh, Ave and to convert Sixth into a uh, a, pl a shared plaza as well. So we done some designs for that. So I would say part of what they needed to do, I think the first step was to do a traffic study to be able to determine is that, you know, is closing that particular block going to, how might it impact traffic in the nearby area? And so they were able to do a traffic study and determine that it was not a major impact in that particular case. Uh, in the case of Homesdale that we had presented, um, you know, the next step would be looking at a traffic study there. But in that case, uh, that street didn't actually connect. It's only a one block street. So there were six other streets that get, got you to the same destination. So so, it, uh, so I would say a lot of this comes back to um, you know, talking to uh, traffic engineers to make sure that it can pass muster with PennDOT and talking with the municipality about whether that uh, can or should be used. And also the public works We'll also be able to identify, you know, what's the impact on above ground utilities, what's the impact on below ground utilities, and uh, try and keep that to a minimum. Great, thanks. So I got two more practical uh, questions and a, kind of a closing thought here. Um, uh, somebody's asking, do you have any recommendations of software programs or apps that can assist in determining a color palette for painting a storefront? I'm not aware of a, of a software uh, okay. that, 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 that would do that. I'm, uh, I'm certainly there are examples of color wheels where you can sort of see which, which colors are complementary uh, with one of a sort of a traditional color wheel. Uh, and I think there are a lot of, of, of um, paint manufacturers who are offering complementary palettes. I mean, I know that I've been looking at Sherwin-Williams recently and they are offering different different palettes to say, hey, these three colors go together, uh, you might like these. So I would say there are a number of, um, of the paint manufacturers recognize that, that color matching is a challenge. And so I would say, look to those manufacturers that they often will provide palettes and say, this is the new theme for 2023. And, and uh, you can certainly start there. Great. Uh, somebody's asking here, um, are able to provide an approximate cost of a preliminary concept design for a single building. Now, of course, that probably is quite a range, but if you can kind of give a ballpark figure. Right. I mean, I think I think we've had um, you know in some of the communities where we're working in, I, th I think that sort of kind of like fourteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars can get you get you a fair amount of services to sort of help make that happen. Uh, I think as soon as it becomes a, a more you know a, a, a much bigger area or involves, you know, electrical, you know, expertise or, you know, structural things, you know, obviously that can change, but you know, for sort of making some basic recommendations for graphics and a new sign and, you know, things like that, it can be in that sort of, you know, $1,500 to $2,000 range. Great. And I, I would also add too, there's a few mainstream organizations uh, in West Virginia that have Kind of piloted programs connecting uh, merchants and property owners to local professionals, whether exterior designers, or architects, to kind of get them funding. So we're looking at that as a possibility as well. Um, not only are you supporting the beautification of your downtown, but you're also supporting local professionals in your community. So it's kind of a win-win yeah. situation. Yeah, um, that's great. Um, so, Mark, I, I had the joy to give you a, a walking tour of downtown York a few months ago. Um, and the way that your mind works is, is wonderful because you pointed out so many uh, things that can be implemented in our city, small things and large things. Um, so with that in mind and knowing that, you know, probably half of our, our attendees today are, are in downtown York. Um, if you kind of just point out a few simple yet effective things you see that can be imp implemented in our city in, in downtown York, what would you kind of highlight? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that I would start with uh, is most downtowns, York is no different, have um, the, say, the missing teeth where there used to be a building there and there's no longer a building there and there's now a parking lot there. Um, and over time, it may take a while for there to be a new building there. But so hedging and edging, that example that I showed of kind of the, the gas station with the, 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 the 
the uh, flowers or daylilies along the along the edge of the sidewalk, that sort of ornamental fence, something to make sure that that if somebody's making major investments, you know, 50 feet to the right, and somebody's making major investments 50 feet to the to the left of, of, of your building. There's nothing worse than having sort of this dead zone of a, of a lot of concrete, a lot of asphalt, and it sends the message, nobody cares. And so I would say the, the, the lowest hanging fruit in my, in my mind is show people you care. And I think I, there, there were a number of examples that, that you and I looked at together of, you know, great examples of baskets, you know, hanging baskets of, of uh, uh, planters, of uh, different ways in which the greening and landscaping of the sidewalk environment uh, and, and the edge of the sidewalk where it meets uh, another paved surface. Focus on that greening to sort of send the message. People care about what happens here. It's being maintained. I think, I think that sends the message that it is vibrant, it is vital, and people are paying attention. I think that will go a long way. I think as I talked about earlier, um, making sure that folks in planning and zoning are, are speaking from the same page about um, how do we make sure that zoning policies and public infrastructure investment uh, are all aligned to help support businesses. And so yeah, there may be ways of saying, this is a location where a blank wall is really not acceptable on, on, on certain blocks. And so make sure that you know, there's at least, you know, 50% glass on that wall or something like that. So I think, you know, finding ways to sort of get on common ground with what's good for the uh, small business, what's good for uh, the business district itself, and how to get kind of the, the ecosystem of desirable, attractive, welcoming streets where the storefronts and the property owners and the business owners are working together with local government leaders to uh, um, make a great place. Great, thanks, Mark. And I, I think uh, you you talked about really a key concept there is you know uh, doing a transformation of a block and having each individual who's part of that process being part of that process. So I think yeah. um, you know, and a few uh, attendees today mentioned this in, in either question or comment form. You know, use this recording as as a as a resource. You know, share it with your uh, your landlord, share it with your uh, adjacent property owners, anybody else in your block or in, in your micro district. Um, um, you know, use Downtown Inc. as a resource. Um, you know, certainly each other, myself or Corey Wolf and our team. Um, we will send out a follow up email to all of our attendees today, um, uh, and we'll certainly include Mark's email address in there as well if anybody has any follow up questions. Um, but I do want to thank you, Mark, for, for uh, joining us today. Um, uh, and I've had the joy of getting to know you in, in several capacities and you're a wonderful guy with a lot of great information. So I appreciate your time today. Um, I also wanna say thanks to uh, PNC for once again, sponsoring our Bloom Business Series for this year. Uh, this is the last uh, series uh, workshop of this year, but stay tuned for more in 2023. And I'll just close with a few um, just Downtown Inc. announcements uh, just to keep you all abreast as to what we're working on and what's going on in Downtown York. Um, we are still accepting vendors uh, for Go Green in the City in April, uh, uh, 2023, which is April 22nd. Um, if you want to sign up now, you can get a uh, discount of 25% off. Um, we're looking for uh, green conscious businesses, artisans with an emphasis on natural repurposed materials, uh, vendors who offer hands-on activities, nonprofits focused on green living. Um, and there should be a link in the chat there if you are interested in learning more about Go Green in the City or look, uh, looking to register as a vendor. Um, we are looking to get downtown York ready for the holidays. So this Sunday, the 20th, is our annual Hang of the Greens, uh, where we decorate downtown York with, uh, with bows and the, the green um, uh, wrapping around the poles. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering, there's, a, there's an email in the chat that you can uh, send an email to to, uh, to volunteer. Um, and that is this Sunday, the 20th, uh, 10 a.m. Um, and um, we hope you can come out and join us. Uh, Small Business Saturday is coming up on November 26th. Um, and we are kicking things off this Thursday, which is tomorrow, with the Small Business Series press conference, 9 a.m. at Parliament Arts Organization. Um, we'll be streaming it on our Facebook if you want to tune in online or you can check it out in person. Um, but if you haven't yet submitted your uh, content for Small Business Saturday, if you're in downtown York, 
uh, please do so. Um, there is a link in the chat right there for you to submit your content, whether you're doing sales, events, promotions. We want to help promote those things for Small Business Saturday. Um, and of course, on that same link, there's also a, a place for you to access marketing materials uh, to help promote Small Business Saturday. Um, so there's a form that you can fill out. So once again, thank you, Mark uh, and Dirk, from Dirk and Edson. Thank you, PNC. And hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care, everybody.